So I guess it's time to get started here. Hi, my name is Michael Adams. I'm a professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Victoria. And I'm going to be talking to you today about text formatting in C++20. Now, before I start the presentation, I just want to mention that the slides that appear in this talk are a very small subset of a much larger slide deck that I have on C++. And the most recent publicly released version of this slide deck is available at the URL that's shown on the slide here. So if you want to obtain a copy of these slides, you can do so later. Um, I just want to mention though that the slides I'm presenting today are not yet released, but they should be in the next few weeks. Currently it's the 2020 edition of my slide deck that's available from this URL. Uh, with that said, let's get into the presentation. Um, I'd ask that you please hold any questions that you have until the end. Uh, the slides are numbered, so you can make a note of the slide number that you have a question about, and I can take your questions at the end. So again, this talk is about text formatting. So suppose that we want to have some text formatting utility. What ideally would we like it to have in terms of properties? Well, first of all, we'd like it to be type safe. We don't want to have anything would allow, which allows us to subvert the, the type system in the language. Uh, we'd like it to be extensible. And what I mean by this is we want it to support user-defined types. We don't want to only be able to format built-in types like floats and doubles and ints and so on. We also want to be able to handle the classes that we write as well. We'd like the formatting utility to be localizable. In other words, be able to accommodate different regions in the world very easily uh, because different regions in the world format things differently. If you just take something as basic as a radix point in a number, uh, some countries, like for example, Canada and the US, uh, use a period for a radix point, but there are some countries, for example, that use a comma. So we want to be able to accommodate differences like this in the formatting utility. We also like a formatting utility that leads to highly readable source code. We don't want something that when we look at it, you know, look at the source code, we can't really understand very easily what it's doing. And then lastly, because this is C++, efficiency is important. We don't want a text formatting uh, facility, which is going to be very slow and inefficient. Now, before I get into the uh, discussion of what's been added in the C++ 20 standard with respect to formatting, I first want to take a, uh, consider a few motivating examples. So suppose that we want to provide some kind of formatting capability using either the C standard library or the C++ standard library prior to C++ 20, what might we do? What are some of the possibilities? Well, if we wanted to use only the C standard library uh, for formatting capabilities, we could use the sprintf family of functions. And I just have a small little code example to illustrate how we might use this. So here I have an example of a, a function uh, called format, which returns a std string. So basically it performs some formatting and, and form returns the result in the form of a string. And the arguments that this function takes, it takes a format string, which is a format string that's used by the sprintf family of functions. And then the dot, 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 which is sort of the evil part here. These are all the arguments that are to be uh, used during the formatting process. So if you look at the uh, use of this function down below here, we have this function being invoked format. And the first argument is a, a formatting string. So for those of you who aren't familiar with sprintf, this, this uh, x here is saying that we have a integer argument that's coming up next after the uh, format string. We want to format as a hexadecimal number. The four says we want to use a field length of fours and the zero says we want to print leading zeros on the number. And if we convert 255 into hexadecimal, you get FF. So this is going to lead to the formatted output 00FF and all is well and good in the world. Now this is fairly readable, like once you learn how sprintf uh, format strings work, you can, you can fairly quickly look at this and say, oh yeah, I know what this is doing. So it's fairly readable code, uh, but it has a lot of disadvantages. One is it's not type safe. And for example, suppose that I invoke this format function in the following way, like what's shown on this line uh, here that I've highlighted. In this particular case, in case you're not familiar with uh, sprintf, sprintf format strings, this uh, is saying, the D here is saying that I have an integer argument coming up that I want to format in des as a decimal number and blah, 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 some other parameters or other characters here, which are not unimportant. The critical thing is it's expecting an integer argument, but the type of this argument is a, is a double. 
So we have a problem here, and this code's not going to do probably what you expect. It won't generate a compile error, essentially because of this evil dot, dot, dot here, which is saying, trust me, I know what I'm doing, compiler. I can give you any number of types, and, and just trust me, I know what I'm doing, it's going to work. Uh, but if we mess up, it won't work, and the compiler can't help us. Um, so this code will compile. It will run kind of in quotes, meaning we're not really sure what it's going to do. It probably It's not going to do what we want it to do. Um, and this is not a good thing. So it's not type safe. Also, this, this particular approach is not extensible either because we're using the C standard library to do the formatting. C, you don't have classes, so obviously it, it has no mechanism whereby it could provide a facility for user-defined types. So it can only handle built-in types. So this is not very good. But it is efficient though, as printf is a very, very efficient uh, formatting uh, utility. Let's try a different approach and another motivating example. Suppose that we wanted to implement something using the C++ standard library, but prior to C++ 20. One approach we could take is we could use the IOStreams facility in the standard library because it provides formatting capabilities. It, it formats and does IO at the same time. So what we can do is we can use a, a string stream, which is an IO stream where the underlying storage is a buffer in memory. So basically you're reading and writing from a buffer in memory. So you have a similar function here uh, called format uh, on line eight uh, and it, it returns a string. So it basically performs formatting and returns the result as a string just like we had before. But now the arguments that are provided are kind of arranged differently from before. Essentially what they are are just arguments that can be written to a stream. So what this function does, it just takes in these arguments, it, it writes them to this string stream, which is a local variable, and then it extracts out the string portion of the buffer in memory that's holding that formatted output and returns it. So if you go down below to this, this main function that's using the format function that I was just showing you, uh, this is an example here where we're using the function. Um, so we, we were going to try to do a similar formatting and it's, a pre, it's the previous example. So we want to format the number 255 in hexadecimal using a width, like a field width of four and using a fill character of zero. So we can do this using IO manipulators. So there's the IO manipulator that sets the field width. There's an IO manipulator which sets the fill character. There's an IO manipulator that says we want to output numbers in hexadecimal. And when we invoke this function, the result it's going to produce is the, the 00FF, which is what we want. So all is, all, all is well and good in the world. But even better than before, in the previous example, we can also format user-defined types. So if we have some class, for example, called widget, you know, it's shown on this line here, as long as you defined a stream inserter operator, in other words, operator less than less than for this type widget, we can, we can output it. So we can use it with this format function. So here I've created in the main function down below, I've created a widget called W and then I'm invoking the format function for this widget called W and I'm specifying a field width of eight and a field character of star. And if you look at what the output operator does for widget, since the widget doesn't actually have any data members, there's not really anything to output. So it just prints hello uh, for any widget. So what we end up with this output, which looks like this. It's basically the word hello, formatted in a field of width eight, um, right justified and filled in with stars. So this particular approach is also extensible. You can extend it to any user defined type you like just by providing a stream inserter. Um, but there are some downsides to this approach. One is the most important one probably is that this is not a very efficient uh, formatting scheme because you're dragging in all of the overhead of the IO stream uh, library in order to do the formatting, which you really shouldn't need to do. It's unnecessary overhead. So that's a, a deal breaker if this is being used in, on critical paths in the code where things have to be done very efficiently. And, and to a lesser extent, another thing that's maybe not so desirable about this approach is that it's not, it doesn't lead to really super readable code because these IO manipulators have quite verbose, there's quite a lot of typing that you need to do to invoke them. So you have to actually do a, quite a bit of typing. So if you're kind of scanning through lots of uses of this format function in, in code, it takes a bit of time to figure out what you're actually, like how you're actually formatting things. So it's not the most readable, it's not horrible, but it's also not the very best either. So with that said, now let's shift the focus into C++ 20. In C++ 20, there's a function called format um, and also a, another 
bunch of uh, functions that kind of go along with it, uh, like a family of functions. And these uh, functions have the properties that they, you know, all the desirable properties we talked about before. So they're type safe, they're extensible, they handle user defined types, they yield highly readable code, they can accommodate localization and translation, and also really importantly, they're very efficient. And I've seen some benchmarks that people have done comparing, for example, sprintf, which is kind of about as low as you can go in terms of efficiency. It's like, if you're like super efficient, I should say. Um, and comparing that to std format. And actually some implementations of std format are actually have even been faster than sprintf. So std format is very fast. It's like very efficient. So this is good. So when you're invoking any of these uh, formatting functions, the way that they work is when you invoke them, you specify a format string. And in addition, zero or more items to be formatted. Or it could also be values that are used in the formatting process, the things that specify field widths and so on. And the format string essentially controls how the formatting is done. So to give a very simple example, in the code at the bottom of the slide, I have a use of the std format function here. Uh, so the first argument to this function is a, a format string, which is the string here. And then the remaining arguments are things that are used in the formatting process. This is the item that we want to format. And essentially what this is going to do, maybe no big mystery, the only thing that's a little bit mysterious is probably this part here, which is basically saying format 42 in, as a binary number. Uh, but I'll get into more detail about, about this syntax and like what it means. This is referred to as a replacement field. Um, you can also invoke std format with just a format string, but this is probably not very useful. I'm just pointing out you can do it just so that you're aware of the fact it's not the end of the world if you do invoke it with only a format string, but probably not that useful. If you just wanted a string which was equal to hello world, you'd probably just create a string that was equal to hello world. So as I mentioned, std format is essentially, there's a, like a family of functions. std format is one of them, and it's probably the one that will most frequently be used. But there's a few other functions. There's format2, or maybe I should just comment again. Format uh, takes a bunch of, like a format string and a bunch of arguments that tell you, you know, what to be for, what's going to be formatted, and it returns a std string. So I think the output is in the form of a string. Uh, format2 writes the output to an output iterator. So you provide an argument, which is an output iterator, which could be going anywhere, and that's where it will write the output to. Uh, format to n is similar to format two, except additionally, you can specify the maximum number of characters that should be output. This is useful, for example, if you're formatting to a fixed size buffer and you don't want to overflow the buffer, you can set an upper bound on how many characters can be generated. Uh, entering the formatting process so that you don't overrun the buffer. And then there's a function called formatted size, which doesn't actually do formatting per se, but rather it says like, if I did actually format this data, how many characters would I need of output? And you can use this, for example, for sizing buffers appropriately to hold uh, formatted data. And then there's two other functions, vformat and viewformat2, which are similar to format and uh, format2. The only difference is in how the arguments that are being formatted are specified. And I'm going to cover the first four of these functions in code examples that I have. The last two, which are probably less likely to be used um, by a lot of people, I'm not going to talk about more in this presentation. So I want to talk more about format strings. So a format string is a sequence of replace, what are called replacement fields. These are placeholders for formatted text and escape sequences and characters other than left and right braces. So let's look at an example down below. So here we're invoking the format function and the first argument is a format string. So the format string consists of replacement fields amongst other things. So essentially what a replacement field is is something that's enclosed in a pair of braces. There can actually be characters inside the braces. In this case, the braces are empty. There's nothing inside. But between the braces, this is what we call a replacement field. And what this is, is a placeholder for format attack. So the way std format works is that it scans through the format string and it copies characters in the format string to the formatted output, except when it encounters a replacement field. And when it hits a replacement field, what it does is instead of just copying the characters in the replacement field, like bracket, bracket to the output, what it does is it performs a formatting operation and it replaces the, it writes the formatted output to the output string. So when it sees this replacement field, it, this tells uh, the format function to go to the 
first argument that you haven't used yet and format it. And because there's nothing inside these brace brackets, this is saying use the default formatting. So because this is a string here, the default formatting is just copy the string to the output. So this is going to generate the first part of the result, which is shown here. It will produce the uh, hello portion. Then it, this format function continues to read along in the format string. It sees a comma and a space. These are not part of a replacement field, so they're just directly copied to the output. So this gives you a comma and a space in the output. And it keeps reading along here. It hits another replacement field, which says go to the next item that you haven't used that needs to be formatted, which is this item here, and format it appropriately. In this case, again, since the replacement field is an empty pair of braces, you're not, you're just using the default formatting method. And because the default formatting for method for a string is just copy the characters to the output, we get world appearing in the output here. And then the std format continues along. It sees the exclamation mark. It goes, this isn't a replacement field. It's nothing special. It just copies the exclamation point to the output. And we get our formatted string. Now, this raises the question, well, what happens if you want to like output brace brackets, right? Um, so there's also what are called escape sequences. So if you have two left braces in a row, they're treated as like a, a, a kind of a literal left brace bracket. So when uh, std format is reading through this format string here, when it encounters this pair of two consecutive double braces, rather than treating this as the start of a replacement field, it says, oh, there's two of them. This is just, the user just wants a, a left brace in the output. So this will generate a single left brace in the output. Uh, then it, it keeps reading along here and then it encounters a replacement field and this is going to format the value one as a decimal integer. Then the comma here is not a replacement field. It just gets copied to the output over here. Then we encounter another replacement field which is going to format the next argument which is two and it formats it as a, a decimal number. And then after this, it hits a pair of two right braces in a row. And again, when you have two right braces in a row like this, this is another escape sequence. So it, it's not saying there's something about a replacement field involved. It's saying the, use, the user just wants a single right brace to be output. So you get a single right brace of output here. So that's the basics of uh, format strings. So a little bit more about a format string. So the thing that I've kind of conveniently avoided so far is what goes inside those pairs of brace brackets. Um, replacement fields in the previous examples were all, the, were all empty, empty pairs of braces, but you can put stuff in them to control how the formatting is done and do things in non-default ways. So a replacement field consists of two optional things, an argument specifier, which allows you to say which data item goes with the formatting that you're specifying. And then a format specifier, which is prefixed by a colon, which says, how do you want to format this particular data item? So to give an example, here we have the std format function being invoked with this particular format string here. So unlike in the previous earlier examples, now you'll notice that we have something inside the replacement field. We have like an integer, like a, like a number. And similarly over here. And what these are doing is these are, these are argument specifiers, this first kind of optional thing. And this is saying, I want to actually, this particular replacement field corresponds to the zeroth data item that I want to format. And since things number from zero in, in, C, in, in C++, this is the uh, first item. Zero corresponds to the first data item. So the first formatting, uh, first replacement field corresponds to this data item here. And the one that's denoted by one here corresponds to the second item, again, because things number from zero. You can use, you can use, uh, for, you can uh, use format items in any order. So in other words, they don't have to be in increasing order. So we could use item one first and then item zero. So this would print this item here first, would format this item, and then the zero would format this item. So you would, you would, this would still print hello world because I've reversed the order of hello and world here, but I've also reversed the corresponding indexes. You can also format the same item multiple times. So here we have a data item, which is 10 that we want to format. And you'll see that we're actually formatting it four different times because we have four different replacement fields, all referring to item zero. They all have this index zero at the 
beginning. So they're all formatting the same thing, but you can see they're formatting that thing in different ways because the, what comes after the colon is the, the specification of how the formatting should be done. It's the format specifier from above here. Uh, it turns out that B means use binary, o, o here means use octal, D here means use decimal, and X here means use hexadecimal. Uh, so this is how we end up with this string here. But I'll talk more about the details of these format strings later, or the format specifiers later. And one other thing I should point out is then when you're, when you're using these argument specifiers, like these numbers, like 0, 1, and so on, 0, 1, 2, and so on, you have to make sure that you either number all of them manually or don't number any of them. So it would be illegal to do something like what I've done here, where one of the the uh, replacement fields actually is manually numbering the particular argument that you, you want to refer to. And then this one here doesn't have a number. It's not, it's used, trying to use automatic numbering. So you either have to manually number everything or don't number anything, in which case they just they will automatically be numbered starting at zero and increasing. And this will throw an exception if, if you try to do something like this. So now I want to start zeroing in on the format specifier part, the part that comes after the colon, the thing that says how the formatting is going to be done. So the format specifier consists of a number of different parts or components, which are essentially the items that are listed here. And the items are essentially all optional, like so you don't need to include any of them, but some of them when you include them, then maybe you have to include others. So nominally they're all optional, but sometimes when you include some, you have to include others as well. So you can do things like control field characters. When things are formatted in a field, the field could be larger than the actual item that you're formatting, in which case you might want to fill the empty space with a particular character. You can also do things like left and right justify and center justify within a field. Um, you can control how the sign is output for arithmetic types. There's something called an alternate form, which is just a way of saying there's kind of multiple ways you might format something and there's you know, kind of the normal way and then there's the alternate way. So the hash symbol is used to denote the alternate way. Um, zero is to, used to denote uh, for, for arithmetic types. So you want to have leading zeros included. You can specify minimum field width, a precision and a maximum fields or a maximum field size. Uh, also there's the character capital L, which says you use locale specific formatting. So for different regions in the world, different locales, you can um, have things formatted in a way that depends on the locale that you're using. And then something which uh, specifies the type of the data to be formatted, like is it an integer type of some sort and, and so on. So I'm going to look at these in more detail in what follows. So first let's focus on the type of options for integer types. So these are the, the various different uh, letters that we can use for formatting integer types. So we have like lowercase b, capital B for fi formatting integers in binary format. C is just to output an integer as a character. Uh, D outputs the integer in decimal format. O in octal and then lowercase x and uppercase x in, in hexadecimal. And the default is, is, is D decimal. If you don't include anything, it's as if you type D. Um, so if we go through a few examples here, here we have a data item 42 that we want to format. I'm not showing the std format function here. I'm just showing the arguments to the function because it's a little bit redundant to keep writing out std format over and over again. Um, so the format string that we're using is, is this format string here. So we're reformatting the same data item twice, once with just the uh, default options because we didn't spe specify any format specifier here. There's no colon followed by some other stuff. And then here we're formatting it using decimal. Uh, but since the default is decimal, these will both give the same results. So we end up with 42 for the first uh, replacement field and 42 for the second one. Um, if we look at this next example here, we're repeatedly formatting this data item, which is to the integer value 10. Um, in the first case, we're formatting it in binary. So this just gives us 1010. Zero, zero. In the second case, we're formatting it in binary, but using this so-called alternative format, which said, which is defined as uh, including the zero B prefix, just like what you would do in your source code. So this prefix says what follows is a binary uh, constant. And the, the significance of the lowercase B in this context is that this B will be in lowercase. Um, if we use hash capital B, the only difference is that when the B gets printed, it gets printed in, in uppercase. 
And then maybe just as one other example to consider, if we format the integer as a character, then what it will do is, you know, suppose we have an integer which is equal to 65 on an ASCII system, this corresponds to a capital A, this would then be printed as a capital A. So that's the case of integer types. Uh, when we're formatting character types, we can use all of this same uh, format specifiers that we have for integers, which just do kind of what you'd expect. They form, they, they print the character out as a numerical value. Um, but the default, and also we can specify a C, is to output the character just literally as that character. Um, so maybe to consider an example, here we have the, the character lowercase a, and we're formatting it twice with two different uh, times. One with the default setting, which is this first case here, because there's no colon followed by a format specifier. And then the second case, we're using the C uh, formatting specification. But both of these do the same thing because C is the default. Uh, so we get A formatted both times. Uh, we can also format a character as a decimal number. So this is what we're doing here. We've used the D specifier or D uh, format specifier. It turns out that the asterisk character on ASCII systems has the value 42 you know, because everything's 42, right, in programming. Uh, so we, this outputs a string that looks like this. If we go on to uh, Boolean types, uh, Boolean types, again, you can use all the same kind of format specifiers that you have for integers, which will do kind of what you will expect. It will just print uh, true or false as a value zero or one expressed in various different number bases, which basically look the same. Uh, the only difference is if you include prefixes of zero X and zero B and, and, and a leading zero for octal. Um, and then if you use the, the S or the default formatting uh, option, what it will do is it will print true and false literally as true and false. So for example, if we output uh, true and or sorry, false and true here using the default uh, formatting for these types, it will just print out like literally false and true. Um, in, in a, in, if we use decimal, like what we've done here, then false will, be, will lead to a value of zero and one, true will lead to a value of one. And since we're printing in decimal, we just get zero and one like this. Then if we go on to floating point types, with floating point types, we have a number of different options that we can use. We have lowercase a and uppercase a, which generate output in floating point, hex floating point format. Then we have lowercase e, uppercase e, which use exponential notation, like scientific notation. And then lowercase f, uppercase f is fixed format. So like fixed point representation. And then lowercase g and uppercase g is sort of like a hybrid between e and f. And depending on what you're outputting, it, it chooses between them and so on. And then the default is just g, like lowercase g if you don't specify anything. So just to give a few examples of this, if we take the number 16.75, this, this double value, and we format it using lowercase a and uppercase a, um, don't worry too much about what hex, hex floating point format is if you're not familiar with it. It is like a thing in the language, but you may not have ever used it. Um, if you understand the hardware representation of floating point numbers, then it will make a lot of sense. It basically represents the mantissa part in, in hexadecimal, and then the exponent is expressed in decimal. Anyway, but the key thing to notice here is the only difference between these two different uh, formatted versions of the number, one where we're using lowercase a and one where we're using uppercase a, the lowercase a version, all the letters that appear here are all lowercase letters. So we have an X, a C, a P, they're all lowercase. The only difference with the capital A case is that all the letters that appear are in capital, in caps, like capital letters. And you see this pattern sort of repeat itself through a number of different formatting uh, operations or formatting specifiers. If we consider like lowercase and uppercase E, these use scientific notation, like exponential notation. So you get, if we format 16.75, we get like 1.675 times 10 to the one. And the only difference between the lowercase e and uppercase e, as you can see here, is the uppercase e gives you all uppercase letters. And there's only one letter that appears, which is the e. So here we have an uppercase e, whereas over here we have a lowercase e. And then the fixed point, lowercase f and uppercase f, uh, if we format 16.75, we get 16.75000000, uh, because the default number of of uh, decimal places to include is six. This is specified in the standard. Um, you might say, well, is there really a need for uppercase F? I mean, 
there's not going to be any letters, is there? Well, I, I guess there could be because you could have infinity or not a number, and these print out in terms of letters like I and F for infinity and any N for not a number. And I, I would assume that lowercase f and uppercase f would print them in lowercase or uppercase. Uh, then string types are not really that exciting. There's not really too many ways to format them. You just basically copy the string. Uh, literally, so the, the default is is the same as s, and basically it just copies the the string to the out the formatted output. Now, if we get into sign options, so for arithmetic types, we can control how the sign is displayed. So there's essentially four different options. We can specify a plus sign for how to format the sign, and what this says is always give a sign for every number. So either there's a plus sign or a minus sign in front of everything. Um, the minus option says only include the sign if the number is negative. Otherwise, there's no character output at all. A space, not, not the character space, but like a literal space character, which if I type here wouldn't really show up so clearly. If you have a space, what this says is that if the number is negative, you include the negative sign. But if it's positive, rather than not have anything at all, you have a space. And this is useful probably for lining things up in columns. And then if you don't specify anything, the default is, is if you said minus. So just to give one example of this, suppose that we consider uh, formatting 1.5 in four different ways. So I'm going to consider like kind of four different variations on how we might format it. The first is just using the default formatting because we have a colon followed by nothing. So there, there's no format specification. Um, what this says is that um, you only include the sign if it's a negative number. Since this is not a negative number, we just get 1.5. The next case, we're specifying the minus option, which says to include the sign only if the number is negative. Well, because the number is non-negative, there's no sign to include, so we get 1.5 again. Um, if we format with the plus option, this says always include the sign. So in this case, we get plus 1.5, so the sign is included. And in the last case, we have space for the formatting uh, specifier. And this, what this says is if the number is negative, you include a negative sign. If the number is positive, which is the case here, you include a space. So we get space 1.5. We can also control field width and precision. So the, the width option that can be included is a positive decimal number or a nested replacement field. So we can specify these values using another replacement field, like a, basically a pair of brace brackets. And this is used to specify the minimum field width. So no matter what, you will use at least these many characters when you're outputting the, the item that you're formatting. And the precision option is a dot followed by a non-negative integer or another replacement field, which specifies the precision for floating point types or a maximum field size for string types. So to give an example for strings, um, suppose that we're formatting the string goodbye uh, with this particular format string here. So essentially the, the format specifier is this dot four. So a dot followed by an integer, the or integer value, this is corresponding to a precision. So the, the and, and bec or I should, it's, well, it's a precision, but because we're dealing with a string, this is a maximum field size. So what this is es essentially saying is that we want to output at least four, at most, sorry, at most four characters. So when we output goodbye, after it reaches the D in good, it's exhausted its budget of four characters. It's not allowed to output anything more. And you end up with a string which is equal to good. We can also use a replacement field. Instead of specifying the four as in, as a, in this string directly, what we can do is we can replace the four by another replacement field. And what this says is that there will be another argument that's provided to this function, which gives you the value to use for the, the precision, which in this case is the maximum field size. So this achieves the same goal. The reason why you might find this convenient is there may be situations where you don't know what you want the maximum field size to be until runtime. So you couldn't use a, a, a format string like this because you don't know what value to put into, the, like what number to put into the string. Uh, if you don't know what it is at compile time. So this is very useful for that purpose. Um, if we go on to the next example here, here we're uh, formatting a floating point value, so 75.125. And what we're doing is we're specifying uh, like fixed point, 
and the precision is one. So this means one decimal place should be included. So this will round 75.125 to one decimal place and it will end up formatting as 75.1. In the next case here, we're specifying a, again, a fixed point uh, output for a, a floating point number. And we're specifying a minimum field width of 10. So like no matter what, this is guaranteed to produce at least 10 characters of, of output. So when we format this particular string here, the default precision, or sorry, when we format this particular number here, the default precision is six for, for F, for the F formatting option. So because of this, it's going to include one, two, three, four, five, six, these many digits here. Uh, so we're gonna get 003906 in the, the fractional part of the number. And then we get the leading zero as well. And because we have a, a minimum field size of 10, minimum field width of 10, it has to append two spaces in order for the total number of characters to be at least 10. So that's where, where that comes from. And this format string here, what we're doing is we're specifying both, this is uh, for formatting a floating point number. In other words, this number here is 16.125. We're specifying both the minimum field width, which is specified through this replacement field here, and the precision, which is specified by this, this replacement field here. So six will correspond to the minimum uh, field width, and one will correspond to the precision. So we're going to format this with one decimal place, because the precision is one, so we get 16.1. And because the minimum field width is six, it's going to pad this with spaces so that the total number of characters is at least six. So this is why we get this output. Uh, we also have the ability to introduce field characters in alignment. So we can left justify, right justify, and center data that we're formatting within the field that it's displayed in. Um, and this is done with these symbols here. So for example, if we have the string hello, and we're formatting it in a field of, of size nine, and we specify left justify, then you get hello left justified in a field of nine characters. If we change to, change to a right justification, then you get what you expect. It's basically formatted in a field of width nine, but it's right justified. And then we can center justify, which is the next option here, in which case it's centered within the field. Um, if the number of characters before and after when you center can't be made even, the extra character goes after. So like in this case here, it's, it's not quite centered, it's slightly left to center because the things don't divide evenly. And we can also use fill characters as well. So suppose I want to format the integer 42, uh, but I want to fill any leftover uh, space in the field with a particular character. Um, this is what this is achieving here, this format specifier. So the six is saying the field with this, the minimum field with this six. The hat is saying format the data, center the data in the field, and the X is saying fill up any unused uh, characters in the field with X's. So it's basically six characters. The four two is centered in the field, and all everything else is filled in with X's. As I mentioned earlier, you can do locale specific formatting. So some examples of locale specific formatting are things like the symbol that's used for the radix point, like when we write a, a number. In some countries in the world, the radix point, you know, for example, if we're writing pi, in some countries in the world, we would write a, the uh, decimal point using a period. But there are some countries in the world, for example, that use commas instead. So this is something that would be nice if we could handle when we're printing floating point values to say, you know, whatever country I'm in, do the appropriate thing for that country. Another thing which uh, relates to locales is things like uh, how we separate digit groups. Uh, for example, in, in Canada and the United States, if we separate the hundreds and thousands column with a, co a comma and, and then the millions and the hundred thousands column with a comma and so on. Uh, so we use commas to separate digit groups, but there are some countries in the world that use uh, periods. And these are just some examples. There's other locale specific formatting as well that, that can arise. So just to give a kind of more concrete example of how this is used, because locales may be, depending on the type of programming you do, you may never use locales or very rarely ever use them. Uh, if you're not familiar, there's a type in the standard library called locale. And, and basically you can specify the, the particular locale you want to use when you construct one of these objects. This is the English locale for US, the USA, and this is the English locale for uh, Denmark. 
So if we take and, and format, for example, this integer one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, using locale specific formatting, which is what this capital L is saying. It's saying format using whatever the locale is, is telling you to do. And we're passing this additional parameter to format, which is saying this is the locale that we want to use. In this particular case, it will format this number using a digit separator, which is a comma. Um, it, it turns out that in, in the Denmark locale, the digit separator is a period. So it will format it in this particular way here. Uh, just as another example for formatting a, a floating point number, so something that has a radix point in it, um, here we're using locale specific formatting. Again, I'm using the US and, and Denmark locales uh, for the English language. And you'll notice the only difference between them when I format the same value, which is 1024.125, is in one case the radix point is a period, in the other case the radix point is a comma. And by the way, the only way, reason I'm using approximately equal, I didn't want to use an assertion here because there's a lot of uncertainty about exactly what the output will be when you're dealing with floating point due to the possibility maybe some people are not using the IEEE floating point standard, et cetera, et cetera. But I think probably any system that you're likely to use, unless you're using really kind of strange systems, would, would probably generate the same output as what's shown here. Now I have a few code examples that I'd like to go through to show a few other things that I haven't yet talked about. I mentioned earlier that there's these format to, format to n, and formatted size functions. So far I've been focusing only on the format function. So at this point I'd like to consider a code example that shows the use of these other functions. So now let's look at the code example on this slide. The first function in this code example is called format to array. And what this function does is it takes an array of characters of size n, a format string, and then some number of items to be formatted. And it invokes the format to n function. And the arguments that are being passed to this function, the first one a, is an output iterator, which is indicating where the output should be written to that's generated by the formatting process. And this is simply a pointer to the beginning of the array. The next argument is the maximum number of characters that can be output by the formatting process. Uh, although the array is of size n, because in the next step below here, I'm going to write a terminating null character uh, for the string, I have one less character that I can write into the array when I'm doing the formatting. So this is the reason for the n minus one here. And then the remaining arguments are just the format string and the items to be used during the formatting process. The format to n function returns a struct, and then I'm using one of the members of the struct called out, which is just an output iterator indicating where the formatting process left off when it was generating output. So this is where you would want to output the next character if there was another character to be output. And I use this in order to write the null character at the end of the string. Here we have a character array A, which is of six characters in length. And then we're invoking the format to array function, specifying A as the array that we're going to perform the formatting into. And then we specify these particular arguments here for the format string and the, the data to be formatted. And if you look at the format string and the arguments that go along with it, this is going to output hello and then comma space and then world and then an exclamation mark, at least nominally. However, because the array that we're writing into is only six characters in length, it's going to only output hello, followed by the terminating null character, which is six characters in total. So this will result in the array holding the characters hello plus a null, a null character to terminate the string. The second function we have on the slide is this function make vector. This is similar to the std format function, except instead of for returning the formatted output in terms of a string, it returns the output in terms of a vector of char. So if you look at what this function does, it takes a format string and the items to be formatted as, as parameters. And the first thing it does is it calls the formatted size function to determine how many characters would be generated if the formatting was performed. And then it saves this result that's returned. Then we create an empty buffer and we reserve enough space for all the characters that we're going to 
produced by the formatting process. The reason why there's a plus one here is that I'm going to null terminate this string after I perform the formatting. So I need one more character than what the formatting process would generate. Then I invoke the format to function. And the first argument to the format to function is an output iterator that you want to write the formatted output to. In this case, I'm going to use the back inserter from the standard library. If you're not familiar with this, essentially what this does is it's, it's generating an output iterator that writes to a container by calling pushback. So it's going to essentially keep appending characters to the end of the vector by using pushback. And then I specify format and items, which are basically the format string and the items to be formatted. And this is going to perform the formatting. And then again, I, I'm going to terminate the string with a null character. And then I return this, the, uh, the string in the form of this buffer. In other words, a vector of char. And if I look down below here, this is an example of using that particular make vector function. So I'm passing it these arguments here to specify the data to be formatted and how to format it. And what this is going to do is it's going to generate a, a string which consists of hello comma space world exclamation mark. And this is essentially written into a vector and then returned back to us. So we get back a vector which has this particular contents here, which is null terminated. So this is just a very simple example of using the functions format to n formatted size, and format two. The last thing that I want to talk about is formatting user-defined types. So the standard library provides a, a class template called formatter, which, can, which allows you to specify how the formatting of user-defined types should be performed. And normally you're kind of forbidden from sticking stuff in the std namespace and generally messing with the std namespace. But in the case of std formatter, you're allowed to create your own specializations of std formatter uh, template specializations for classes that you want to be able to format, like classes that you've developed. So the first parameter, which is denoted by T here in this template, is the type that you want to do formatting for. Um, the next template parameter is essentially the type of characters that you're dealing with, because there's different character types in the language. Most commonly what's used is char, but there's also like W char, Y characters and other character types as well. So this is specifying like what type of character type you're using. But pro again, in practice, probably most of you would, be, would tend to be using char. And the template class specialization you provide, it only needs to provide two member functions and that's all. It needs to provide a parse member function and its task is to take the format specifier and extract out whatever information is needed, which will be dependent on the type you're formatting, in order to later do the formatting when you're asked to do it. And the second function that needs to be provided is the format function, the one that actually does the formatting. Uh, so the basic idea is that there would probably be some states, some data members that are associated with this class that you write, where the parser writes this information into these data members so that later on the formatter knows how to do the formatting. And I have a code example to help illustrate this. So maybe I'll start with the, the code that's using the, or actually maybe I need to start with the point type, I guess. So what I want to do is I have this very simple point type. It's a, like a point in two dimensional space where the coordinates are integers, X and Y. And I want to be able to format this, this uh, particular type using std format. Uh, so if I just try to do this without doing anything special, it wouldn't work because if I try to invoke std format, std format is going to get upset that it doesn't know how to format a point. So what I do is I'm going to provide a template specialization of std formatter for the type point. So like this is basically saying this code here is going to be used to format objects of type point. And if I go over to the code that uses this this uh, functionality, I can do something like I can create a point P, which has the coordinates one minus two. And then I can do something like std format. And I want to be able to, I, I can just do like a default formatting of this point P. And I want the default behavior to be, it prints the coordinates of the point with no white space. So it's like one, it's separated by a comma. So we have like one comma minus two and enclosed in round brackets. But just to be, to be kind of more fancy, we want to also provide the capability of an alternate format. So we're gonna use this hash symbol to mean alternate format. 
And our alternate format is almost identical to the original format, except we replace the round brackets with brace brackets. So now we're outputting the, the coordinates enclosed in brace brackets. So how can we do this? So this is what I want to look at now. So the class that we provided, which is relatively short, because uh, we're not really doing anything too fancy here, um, it consists of two member functions and also some state. We have like one piece of state here, which is essentially a Boolean flag to remember, do we want to use the alternate formatting where we're using curly braces, or do we just want to do the default thing where we use round, round brackets to enclose the coordinates? So this is uh, defaulted to false because we want the default behavior to be, if, like if nothing specified, we use round brackets. So by default, curly braces is disabled. And if we look at our parse function, what this does, so the parse function takes a single argument, which is what's called a format parse context. And this type has a number of different members, but the only ones that are really relevant with respect to this example, this is a member function called begin and one called end, uh, which essentially tell you the, the range of characters that you need to consider when you're parsing the format specifier. So we loop as long as we don't hit end, and also if we don't hit a closing brace, because we this would be a signal that we have kind of reached the end of the, the format specifier. And if we're not kind of through the format specifier, if there's actually more characters to look at, we check to see is the character a hash symbol? If it is, we, we set the true flag for, the, the, for curly to say we want to use curly braces. Um, otherwise, if it's not the hash symbol, because the only thing that our formatter understands is the hash symbol, anything else is an illegal character. In this case, we just throw an exception saying it's a bad format specifier that was provided. And the return value is just where we left off. Like, so we're, we're, we're walking along through characters in the, the, uh, the format string. And when we're finished, we have to return back to the code that called us where we finished so that it knows where to continue on processing from. The other function we need to provide is a format function. And what this does is it first, the first parameter has the type which matches whatever this type is. So it basically you're being passed the type that you want to format, which in this case is a point. And you're also passed a format context. And for the purposes of this example, the only thing that we need to worry about with respect to this format context is it has a member function called out. And what this returns is an output iterator, which is where should we write the next character of output? So rather than write our own format code here, what we're going to do is we're going to use the format to function to actually do the formatting that we want to do. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to have a replacement field, which corresponds to the leading, the opening brace bracket or round bracket. We pick one or the other, depending on whether curly is true or false. Then we output the actual coordinates separated by comma. So we have two replacement fields for them. So this is going to be p dot x and p dot y separated by a comma. And then we have our another replacement field here, which corresponds to the closing brace bracket or round bracket, depending on which one is selected. And we choose between them using this curly boolean. And the return value is just the, out, the output or iterator where we stopped, which is what's returned by format two. And that's basically all there is to making this work. And maybe one other thing I should point out is uh, now that we've kind of looked at the code on the previous slide in more detail, if we were to try to invoke std format in this particular way, this will result in an exception being thrown because when we're processing the format string in our parse function, it's going to hit this character X and it's going to say, I don't know what X is. I don't handle X. This is not a valid way to format this, this point type and our code throws an exception. So this would result in exception being thrown. And I guess the only other thing I want to say is that uh, if you want to start using the format functionality in the standard library, at the time of this presentation, neither the Clang or GCC uh, standard libraries have support for format. However, the person who originally proposed format for adoption in the standard, uh, Victor Zerovich, he's developed like a library which the standards version of std format is based on. Essentially his library is a superset of what's in the standard. It's, it's what I used for all of my code examples, for example, to make sure that they work correctly and so on. Uh, you can obtain the documentation for it at this first link that's shown here, and you can get the code on GitHub from here. And it's pretty easy to get to, to download and build and, and, use, and uh, use along with the standard library. 
So at this point, I can stop for any questions. Um, thanks. This is uh, Leo. Thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Um, it, do you know when they're slated to be included in uh, GCC and Klein? To the best of my knowledge, GCC 11.1, which is likely to be released in April or May, and Clang 12.0.0, which is likely to be released in March, don't have any support for STUD format. I would, however, say the chances are quite good that support for STUD format will appear in both GCC and Clang before the end of 2021. At least this is my best guess. Are there any other questions?